We got to save thousands of producing bushes and many hardworking store owners this way. The shop owners were very happy that their stock was both being properly preserved and finally going to an appreciative use. They got to take their most important belongings with them, whatever they could carry, but did have to leave their gardening supplies behind. Where they were going, there was going to be plenty more good plants and supplies. They would have a choice of basically whatever they wanted there in terms of gardening. The gardeners would get special gardening status. That was one of the highest levels and honors we had. We gave this out due to the sacrifice they made, but also since they had so much experience with year-round gardening, all of the feedback we received from the gardeners was really good, and it was also nice to see all of these fruit bushes doing well. People just had to tend to them now to make sure nothing happened to them. If they did need something special that we didn't have local to them, we could trade hub it over to them. That meant someone could drop it off at a trade hub and have someone else pick it up and bring it to the next trade hub and so on. The process would repeat sort of like the mail until it got to them. This is how we moved bigger items. So if the gardener had special requirements, they could request it over the radio. We could find it and trade hub it to them. It took a little while, but we could do it. One of the biggest concerns with these new fruit-bearing plants would be to make sure animals just didn't flat out eat the bushes down to the root before they had a chance to get going. The biggest culprit of this would be the deer who loved to munch on bushes as they tried to grow. It was a simple matter to handle the deer though as people were hungry anyway so there weren't exactly deer around. The birds were going to be obnoxious and eat whatever they wanted anyway once the fruit started growing though hopefully they could stick to worms or something. We tried to intersperse trees and shrubs with berries that heavily multiplied like strawberries which went crazy in the Pacific Northwest. So whenever we could rescue even tiny starter strawberry plants, even the tiniest ones, we would grab them. We'd stick pots down if the runners were going somewhere they couldn't actually grow and that's how we saved them. Then shared them back out pot by pot so everyone could grow vast strawberry fields. In one season, we knew these would quintuple, and within a few years, there would be an entire strawberry field at each one of those spots, whether anyone wanted one there or not. We hoped this would offset grazing animals nibbling the bushes and trees to death before they could get going. We hoped hunting would keep the grazers away naturally for a little while. We also hoped that cherries would keep the birds busy enough to not just wholesale destroy everything also, also... The wild cat population had started to naturally come back, which would hopefully keep some of the birds a little more cautious like how they used to be. In time, the coyotes and wolves would come back and keep the cats shoot away most of the time. The coyotes and wolves would keep the deer naturally shoot away, and then the ecosystem would be back to normal. So anyway, within a few months, all of the trash bushes had been replaced with legitimately productive fruit-bearing bushes. This area was no exception, and in between each tree was a fruit-producing bush, and on the ground floor would er, be creeping varieties of strawberry plants getting started. As I tried to keep up my pace with where I guessed the teams would be, I started to notice an upsetting trend, though. As I got down the path next to the river that I would have to follow, these bright green bushes started to spring up. I couldn't see where the strawberries were at all and this new plant was overtaking the fruit trees. I got close to one and got my phone out. My phone had never died on me. It was a model where two companies had temporarily cooperated and made an amazing collaboration. I had probably had this phone six or seven years now where most people's phones barely lasted eight or nine months. People used to tease me all the time, oh, what model is that? And I would tell them exact, the exact model number, proudly having recently purchased it through a careful, through careful research and patience. They would repeat the number sarcastically back to me and they, went, and they would all laugh and mock me. Within a few months though, each of them always had a phone failing and there I was using the same phone the same day as if I'd got it out of the box. The phone's quality became notorious, and I found out his name later got repurposed to mean a fictional material that was unbreakable. Pretty funny. 
They kept telling me it was going to die, but it never did. I loved my phone. Anyway, I held my phone up to the top half of a leaf of this huge stocky plant about two inches away from it. And it was out of focus, but there was a trick. I held down on the screen of the camera and made a point with the tip of my finger as carefully as I could. My camera refocused and pulled back as far as it could through a super high resolution picture. Oh, and took a super high resolution picture of the top half of the leaf so I would have a record to ask around back at camp. Well, it looked innocent enough, I thought to myself. I thought back to my Boy Scout days of all the uncomfortable plants that were out in the wild and figured I would try to get a picture underneath also. Didn't look anything like Devil's Club. What was it? I didn't have any tongs or see any sticks around. This trail looked very neatly kept except for these oversized nettles. I didn't really want to risk cutting off a part of the plant and have it touch me anyway. in any way. They couldn't move, but they had leaves that caught the wind and at moments could seem to snap out at you. I also didn't have the right kind of gloves to protect me from these if they had some kind of toxic oils. Taking all this into consideration, I decided to do the same camera trick on the upside down. It took me about three tries since I couldn't see what I was doing and was trying to be super careful to not get touched by the plants in the light breeze. Eventually, about 30 anxious seconds worth of trying, I got a picture to come out as ultra-focused of the bottom half as I did the top. I didn't know what to make of these images. On the bottom of the leaves, it definitely, definitely looked like hooks on the bottom of the leaves with a glint or sheen on them. Good thing I didn't touch them. I couldn't imagine what kind of reaction I may have had. I was still thinking about what if I had to try to remove some of the bushes, though. I did have my big folder, a border guard knife with me in my backpack, and a side pocket I could always get to easily. It had a Tonto style blade that I loved and I had specially customized to just the way I liked it. It had the awful belt clip removed that seemed to have been installed almost at an a as an afterthought. I'd been watching a Border Patrol show pre-collapse and had been so delighted to see that Border Patrol actually used these knives. It made me feel super cool. I had replaced where the belt clip was with the different size screws that fit the holes left behind flush. I also had some paracord fit through next to where the glass breaker was, where I could put my wrist through for extra support. The paracord could also help turn it into an improvised spearhead someday for fishing if I needed to lash my knife onto a pole. I always made sure my everyday carry tools had a million purposes and this knife was no exception. It had been my car tool and city safety friend before the collapse, as I was able to take it where carrying a sidearm was the worst imaginable crime. I held it an hour or longer each direction on my daily commutes, as it could do a lot of fun things to keep me amused. Most of all was aggressive gripping on one side that I loved to rub my fingers over. It was also just plain fun to pop the blade out as it always just presented itself with the happiest pop like it was happy to come see what there was to do. Though I did have to be careful because I was cleaning the blade once and oil got in a retention area a little bit so sometimes the blade would come out a tiny bit by itself. So how I carried the knife and played with it had, had to be a little bit more cautious than otherwise. It definitely or it eventually dried back out though. Among everything else the knife could do it also had a seat belt cutter which I mentally repurposed now into a safe clothes cutter if I needed to do first aid. As for the blade, it had a serrated piece I could almost saw with. It had a sharp edge beyond that and a robust tip and a slightly offset and shallow V-shape. So with my knife, I could have cut down some of these new plants if I wanted to or had to. It had the reach I wanted, but I just didn't want to risk it after seeing those large hooked portions of leaf underneath. The plants glistened with something that didn't look ordinary for a plant. It looked unusual for a plant to look oily and glossy. Did nettles always look that way? My brain couldn't make up its mind either way. I thought more and came to the conclusion in the brief moments all this went through my head that if the oil from the plant got on my knife, it w I would have to get it off somehow. 
would I wipe it off on my clothes? Then the next thing it would do is seep through my clothes and touch me. This stuff is toxic, which I had the really bad feeling it was oh, if this was toxic. I could see this would be a huge problem. I just hoped it wasn't too toxic. Hopefully the animals are just sleeping and the people at the plaza just have a cold or something. I pushed the thoughts out of my head as there was nothing left I could do or think about and moved forward.